Hi, welcome to this edition of On Tap, presented by FCSI of the Americas. I'm Wade Kaler, Executive Director. On Tap this week, I have our former FCSI Worldwide President and former Chairman of FCSI of the Americas. He's one of the pioneers for independent food service consultants in Latin America and one of my very good friends. He's an amazingly humble man and incredible husband and father. Please welcome the owner of Gastrotech, based in Santiago, Chile, Mr. William Taunton. Hi, Bill. Welcome to the show. How are you, Wade? I am doing great, man. How about yourself? Every day getting better. Very, very good. We're going to get to what you've gone through in the last 12 months here in a bit, but I, I want to start off every show with a little bit of background of, of, of how you got into the hospitality industry and then ventured into becoming a food service consultant. So can you give us a brief uh, history background of Mr. Taunton and how you got into this industry? Wow. I, I know I look young, but I've been, <laughs> I, I've been, I've been here for too many years, I guess. <laughs> I, I started uh, 35 years ago. I, uh, yeah, it, it's to, yeah, 35 years ago. And uh, I started working with my dad. He was a food service equipment distributor in Chile and Mexico. And I started uh, in this business was created by my dad and my, my grandfather. So it was like natural to, to walk into my dad's business. I, I got 20 at that time. And uh, we were living in Mexico. Uh, I left college and uh, I decided to move back to Chile. Uh, we lived from, from Chile uh, to Mexico back in 74, uh, not for political reasons, but because of economical reasons. Yeah. Chile was uh, the, the, one of the poorest countries in, in Latin America uh, at that time. So my dad got a, a job opportunity in Mexico. We move over there. He grow again his, his business in the food service equipment distribution and, and manufacturing. And, and then in, in 86, I decided to, to come back to Chile and start doing my, my, my own stuff. Okay. Started from a, like a candle that was burning, uh, burning off, and I grow it from over there. And I uh, opened our company in Chile, Argentina, and Brazil and, and started to work from over there. Then the the Asian crisis came in 1998, and I lost it everything. A couple of years before, it was the tequila effect, economic effect in Mexico, and my dad lost it all in Mexico. So we basically shrink back to almost nothing, and uh, and uh, I decided that I was young enough to start by my own, but I need my family to, you know, to, to, to have a job and, and, and keep on working. So my dad took over the company here in Chile. We closed the Mexico operation, the Argentina and Brazil operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went out to the world and trying to find out what I wanted to do. One thing I, I was very clear is that I wanted to be in the food service business because I really like it. Yeah. And one of the, the persons that, that, helped me out to take that decision is an old FCSI president and uh, he was a good member, a uh, long time member, uh, Mike Colburn. Oh yeah. Remember Mike? Absolutely. And Mike, Mike told me one day, because I was working with the uh, Blodgett company at that time, and so he was working with Blodgett, say, Bill, you're a very good teacher. So you should be a consultant and say, what is a consultant? Ne I, I was the first one in, in Latin America, to be honest. So it was nobody over here when I started. So I signed up. I went to the web page. It wasn't too many web pages at that the time, but it was a, a FCSI web page in uh, 1998, I think it was, 1999. And uh, I decided to, to join. And I was in the first in, in Washington, D.C. I gave my, my test. It was the first ever test to become a professional member in F FCSI. And that's how I started, Wait, <laughs> Very, very good. Well, as you said, you've been in, in ups and downs, especially being in Latin America. We know the, the economic industries or economic areas kind of hit or miss, depending on the year, it seems, uh, as many years as I've known you. With Gastrotech, what are some of the main uh, areas that you focus in on as far as segments or specialties of the industry? 
Well, we don't have the the, the luck the, the luck in in this part of the world that that we can select, you know, uh, yeah, a, a business area where you want to be. Uh, but but to be honest, uh, I like uh, hotels. I like lots of uh, hospitals and mining camps. Yeah, that has been mostly what I do, and and and, and lots also of uh, commercial or institutional food service. Because in my first years as a consultant, I become the the internal consultant for a company that later on was bought by Armark. So they they bought the the operations of Central Restaurantes. Uh, and uh, and I was the guy doing all their uh, technical uh, definitions in in our mark Latin America, Chile, Peru, and Argentina. We know members that have uh, designed kitchens and, and been involved with kitchens that have been installed in in multi level, multi story buildings. But you're the only consultant I know that goes underground significantly underground. What is probably so people that aren't familiar with mining industry, which is very big down in Latin America, obviously. Tell somebody a little bit about how deep your kitchens are, how far underground those kitchens really are that you're designing and having to figure out how to do operations for. Well, I would say in Latin America, uh, about 80% of of the mines are open pits, but about 20% of them, they are... uh, they, they they go deep in the in the ground. The deepest I've I've developed something is something like uh, thousand feet, okay, below. And basically, this is like a net of of tunnels that connect under under the the ground, and you gotta set up sometimes uh, dining rooms, not full kitchens, but the dining rooms mm-hmm. underneath. But you have a little uh, dish dishwasher area and a servery, yeah. basically. That's what you do underground. On the top, you do the, the, the kitchen, and then you, you got to take that food and put it down, whatever it takes. But uh, we, I've been, myself, I've been up to 700 meters, which is 2,100 2, yeah. feet below, uh, just visiting – but you never had something that deep in terms of a uh, food service installation. Well, what people don't realize a lot of times, too, from what you've told me, is those cafeterias or those dining rooms, you have to, those are actually, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call them officially, but they're the area that in the case of an emergency is where they're supposed to get to as well, right? Almost like a safe room, if you will. It, it's like a shack. Yeah. They use them as a shack, a security, a security shack. Okay. Where you have... A box. If you remember, like what was like eight, nine years ago, it was thirty-three miners that that were were stuck Correct. down there in in a mine camp, yeah. uh, in a mine site. And well, that mine site, wait, it wasn't the best installation in terms of security and nothing. It was what it's called small mining. Okay, but it was a very, very old installation, and these people survived because one of those shacks was down there. Okay, so there you go. And then they dig, they dig 700 meters, find them right in the spot, and bring them up in a capsule. Yeah, that's amazing. It, it was pretty amazing, yes. The stories you've told me about of working in those uh, always have amazed me, and so I appreciate that. I, it was Sometimes it's more uh, amazing when you go not down there because you can't see anything down there (laughs) but when you go up in the mine sites that are five thousand meters which is like fifteen thousand or sixteen thousand feet above sea level and and that's pretty pretty hard too yeah you can't breathe you feel terrible (laughs) (laughs) so you were heavily involved with fcsi for over the past 10 years both you and i traveled quite a bit together and served on many boards what do you miss about being on the board? Being updated <laughs> <laughs> on what's going on, basically. Yeah. And is there anything you don't miss, though? I haven't been in a plane, Wade, uh, right now <laughs> for about since November 19. So I've been almost a, a year and a half without getting in a plane. And let me tell you something. Nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's And for you, I know how amazing that is. And, and, and I do want to lead into that because uh, for our viewers and our members of FCSI and everybody else out there, COVID hit 
really close to home for you with that being you getting COVID and getting very sick and almost dying twice from this thing. You, my friend, are an anomaly in the fact that you've been able to walk away from something that was very, very serious. It, Without going into a ton of details and everything, can you just give us a brief uh, history or a brief story about what you've personally went through in the last 12 months? Well, it, at home, it, my, my wife has always had heart problems, and, and everybody knows that. And uh, so we were all at home, you know, taking a lot of care for her. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my oldest daughter, Maria Jose, she's a doctor, and she was working in a COVID pavilion in, in one of the public hospitals here in, in Santiago uh, as a doctor in charge of one of these. Uh, these uh, and, uh, but we were taking a lot of care at home. And uh, one day I was feeling like like uh, like a cold, you know. Mm -hmm. I got some fever and and I was shaking, and uh, and my my head uh, hurt a lot. So I decided to go to the to the hospital uh, emergency room to just to to check that I don't have anything because right. it was very cold. This was last winter right uh, over here we're in the middle of winter over here right now right. and uh so i thought i i catch a cold because we were not going out i mean the only one that can go out at home at that time we we were in a complete lockdown over here mm -hmm. it, it was my daughter and and we weren't even getting close to her well i went to the emergency room they put the, they did the pcr and like uh, they say you gotta wait for a about two hours, so I was over there sitting, waiting, and I start feeling, you know, pretty pretty bad. You know, can breathe. They they connect me to the machine to to see my oxygen levels, and I wasn't really saturating much. I was saturating like seventy percent, uh, with with uh, below ninety ninety two percent, something like that. I yeah. think <laughs> you you are in trouble. So they decide to take a chest. Uh, uh, chest uh, x-ray x-ray that's yeah. the, the word i was looking for and they say well sir you're not going anywhere you're going up to the to a, a room because you have covid and uh, it's not looking good your lungs are not looking very very good i was never ever before was sick. I've always had back pains yeah. and, and, and I, I got a surgery, if you remember, yeah. a back surgery. But but in general, my health was always very, very good. Well, uh, two days after uh, I was uh, I was put in the hospital, I started lost, uh, losing my mind. I mean, I, I because of uh, the, the medicine they were giving me, I was really losing it. Can't remember much details. The only thing I remember is that I got uh, uh, a arterial clog. I don't know how you say that. Uh, it, uh, it's called one of my arterias was clogged. Okay. And yeah. They, uh, thrombosis. Oh, oh, thrombosis. Yeah. So I almost lose my my left arm because of this thrombosis. That's uh, the last thing I remember. That was because of COVID. And, uh, and then they intubated me, uh, right. as far as I understand, and I was intubated like five weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, among those five weeks, I, I don't know. I just <laughs> lost it, you know, yeah, because exactly. you, you are totally uh, out of, yeah. uh, of your mind. And uh, I was told by my daughter and, and, and my doctor that... Uh, uh, my lungs were in between 95 and 98 percent destroyed by the by the pneumonia. Yeah, and uh, and then uh, the the fibrosis. That's what the way. Oh yeah, yeah. Lung fibrosis. So three times during that period, uh, they were saying, "Okay, we gotta unhook this guy because it's, it's nothing good. This is non -re recovery." Right. Right. <laughs> And uh, well, I, for whatever reason, the day before my 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 fifty sixth birthday on September second, 
they woke me up, they untube me, and uh, they put me out of a ventilator. They woke me up. My crisis started over there because when you're sleeping, you know nothing. Yeah. So it's the family, the ones that are really suffering about what, yeah, of course. what was really going on because you don't know nothing. I never saw the light, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, the only thing I, I, I saw was, uh, I can say, the, the, the hell, because everything was black. That's the only remembrance I have. Everything was black or dark brown or dark, uh, like a dark purple and uh, some noises, and, and that's it. And, and then, well, when I woke up, uh, I, I lost it about 36 pounds yeah uh, and i didn't know, know how to almost to talk i can hardly see uh, for sure I, I wasn't able to 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 read or write anything i didn't knew where i was what happened to me how long have pa how long time right. passed so after that it took me like 90 days to get back in my feet yeah and start you know, re reliving and yeah. reconnecting with everything. Very good. It was pretty hard. I'm glad to see you're doing well now. You look fantastic. I, I saw the pictures right after you got out of the hospital and, and the weight loss was pretty dramatic. And uh, it's really good to see you today um, because you look amazing. You look great. I've gained all the, my weight back. I, I, I mean, this, this damn thing will never going to leave me because right. it left some stuff you know, in, in my body that, that, that I will have to live with them for the rest of my life. Last week, I started with a knee, with a knee okay. problem. And believe it or not, it's because of all the weight I lost when I regain it. It didn't regain it the same way it was. So oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm having a problem with, with my right knee right now. I hope, uh, hopefully that's a minimal thing that you have to worry about. A knee pain is, uh, what you've been through, a knee pain is pretty... Uh, Pretty miraculous. That's all you've got so far. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Being at home again, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I don't want to keep dwelling on that. It, it, your story is amazing. If they want to know more about it, I'm sure everybody's going to be asking you about this the next time they see you. Uh, but I certainly couldn't go through this episode without at least finding out a little bit more and letting everybody hear your story. Um, what's one thing about Bill Taunton that most people would never guess when they meet you? That I'm very sensitive and I cry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about, when we are in meetings and w when we talk about things, people don't understand that I'm, I'm basically a family boy. Yeah. And that's the way I am. I mean, it's everything is, for me, it's at home. Uh, I work in my, in my marriage. Uh, I've been married for uh, almost 28 years. In, in a couple of months, it's going to be 28 years. I got five kids and uh, very proud of that. Very, very proud of that. That's that's the center of my life. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I can attest to that. I've seen both the sensitive side and the family. So I can definitely <laughs> vouch for both of those. What's one piece of advice you'd give to anyone uh, that's thinking about becoming a food service consultant? Find a good teacher. <laughs> oh. I've got many. I've got many over 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 my life, and uh, I would say I continue to to learn things from from the people that I work with. Uh, one of the things I've always tried to do is I learn very early in in the consulting in, in, in the times when I when I started is that that you need people to show you what they know. Yeah. So I'm always uh, open to show younger people. Uh, what I know, but I all the time uh, trying to work with people that can teach me something, Absolutely. something that I don't know. And the most important thing in a consulting business, from my perspective, is experience. You got Absolutely. you got to commit mistakes. If you don't commit mistakes, that's why they pay you because you exactly. have committed the mistakes before. Right. People exactly. don't pay you a bunch of money because you you think you will resolve something. People yeah. hire you and pay you a lot of money to do, uh, not to commit the mistakes you have done it before. Right. That's right. That's the way I see it. And I, I know you haven't traveled for a while, but you are, you are certainly a global traveler in experience at, uh, that I know of. What are, 
when you get ready to travel to a client's uh, operations or maybe to an, a meeting with a client, what are the three must haves that you make sure you pack before you leave? <laughs> your computer, <laughs> your phone, <laughs> your computer, your phone, because when you're out, I mean, and, and a, a good, uh, a good uh, contact list of people because you're always going to need that being somewhere. Sometimes you get a plane drop you in some place that you don't know. Always you got to have a very good contact list of people because being world travelers, uh, you happen to know people from all over the world. And sometimes I remember another old time member of FCSI, Chris Bigelow, the first time I, I went to a board meeting, Chris was over there and said, Bill, I'm sometime I'm going to go there to your home and have a beer and say, sure. Nobody came to Chile at that time. And uh, one day I was in my office here in Santiago and I received a phone call say, Bill, yes, this is Chris Bigelow. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so we had dinner that night. There's many consultants from the U S that have came over here and we have joined for dinner. I mean, Steve from, from, uh, from, uh, uh, oh, Steve, this is one of the COVID problems. Sometimes my memory is it's not coming back. We won't blame that on age at all. We'll blame COVID. I like no, that. No, it's COVID. <laughs> Everything is COVID. Wait. Exactly. <laughs> I got something to, to blame for it. <laughs> there you go. Very good. That's all the formal questions I've got for you today. But before I let you go, I, I've got some fun ones. So we'll end a little bit on a lighter note with you today. Um, this speed round, we'll just get into it. And uh, there's some off the wall questions here. I think you'll enjoy. What's your favorite breakfast cereal? Granola. Granola. And is that the same do you, the, as when you were a kid? No, never had any cereals when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Would you rather go to a fancy restaurant or a local dive? Local dive. What's one vice that you cannot let go of or can't part with? Scotch. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I, sh I should have known that one, by the way. It's always over here. <laughs> Puppies or kittens? Puppies. What do you do when you're stuck in traffic to pass the time? When I was younger, scream and be nasty. <laughs> Today I basically turn turn the, the volume of the of the radio higher. Okay. Close the windows and put it very, very high. Nice. <laughs> live on a moon base or live on the Mars base? Live on Earth. Okay. Would you consider yourself more spontaneous or more of a planner? Spontaneous. Uh are you a morning person or a night owl? Morning person. Uh soft tacos or crunchy tacos? Mm, depending on how much beer. <laughs> <laughs> Coke or Pepsi? Coke, but right. but I don't I don't like cola cola right. drinks. But that's all right. I still for, I still forgive you. <laughs> I prefer a Seven Up. <laughs> cookies or brownies? Cookies. Well, uh, any particular type of cookie? Uh, chocolate chip. Okay. You know that, those big soft ones you put in the in the meetings. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Are you a, are you more of a day planner kind of guy or do you use a digital calendar nowadays? A uh, digital calendar. Okay. I, I, I've been able to learn how to, to manage them well, but Very always good. I have, as you can see over there in my wall, a printed calendar. That's basically for, for putting my trips. Right. They're blank right now, <laughs> but <laughs> every month I got, normally I got three, the month before, the actual, yeah. and the, the, the coming up. Nice. And the last one for this is, if humans came with a warning label, what would the warning label you wear say? Too sensitive. All right. Very good. Well, hey, before we let you go, tell people, uh, tell the audience exactly how they can find out more about you. We have a webpage, uh, www.gastrotech.cl, or always in my, in my cell phone. I've been the same cell phone since they ever exist. 569-9874-3746. And I'm always available. Doesn't matter the, 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 the time zone where you are. It's always on. Well, that wraps up this edition of On Tap presented by FCSI, the Americas. A huge thank you to Bill Taunton today for joining us. We, we can't do this show without members like you. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your favorite podcast and to make sure to turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any future episodes. But until then, cheers. <laughs>